Hi, welcome to day three. We're going to talk about the fall today. Boom, 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 boom. You know, I've heard people say that the Bible can be divided not by the Old Testament and the New Testament, but really the Bible is divided up between Genesis 1 and 2, so that is before sin, and then Genesis chapter 3, life with sin, and God drawing a picture and bringing us Christ um, and showing us ourselves, and also through that and through story revealing his character and who he is. Here we go. Let's start the journey of sin entering the world. I know I feel the same way. Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, did God really say that? You know how Adam got the instructions? I have a feeling Adam pretty much saying, hey, Eve, don't even go there and don't even touch it. Has that happened to you <laughs> or your parents? I do that sometimes with my kids. But the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil as if that's a good thing. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Duh, I know. Here you see she didn't really know the actual word of God because she had a version of it. You see how Satan took that. Satan knew exactly what was told Adam. He, he, bore witness. He was there. And so he then kind of twists the word, making Eve question God. Because really, what is our struggle? Our struggle is to believe God for what he said. And we like to thwart it, and we like to twist it, and we like to manipulate his word to justify our sin. Just like our parents, our first parents. Verse 7, Then the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Don't you just love that? You know, they were naked and unashamed, and you know, I know my kids are like, oh, they were naked. Okay, th that's really meaning they were transparent, they were open, there was nothing to be ashamed of. It's not really about being naked, but... But in this case, it was. Now they are. They realize, oh my goodness, we're naked because they're sinning. So then what do we do? Whenever we have sinned, what do we do? We go try to cover ourselves and we go grabbing and gravitating towards our fig leaves. When all we need to do, go to God. So they're hiding. So what do you do when you first realize you're sin you've sinned? You hide. You go for cover. You go to justify yourself. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? I love that. Don't you love that? I love that God invites us to repentance. So did he say, where are you? Because he really didn't know where they were. No, exactly. He was asking, where are you? Because he's giving them a chance to repent. He's inviting them an invitation. Come to me. I know you're hungry and thirsty. Come to me for it. Okay. Total dead giveaway that he sinned, right? Like, how do you know you're naked? Again, God, it's not like he didn't know. He's inviting Adam to fess up. Don't you love the finger pointing? Uh, he did, She did it. She did it. But see, what's even more dangerous here is that Adam is blaming God because he's saying, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate it. So I blame you, God, because you gave her to me and I saw I'll blame her and I am just a victim to you and her. Mm -hmm. Does that sound familiar? And again, it's also another invitation to Eve. Hey, fess up, honey. And also, by the way, Adam, you were silent, right? You were like, okay, let's eat this. Adam was silent. He was there. He's the one that got the direct information from God, and he was silent. Not trying to justify Eve, but I think Eve often gets a bad rap here. I mean, yeah, she, I mean, she, she did sin, but let's think about it. As a woman, you know, she's the grocery shopper, right? She didn't get the direct order from God. In Adam's silence and his failure to speak up, he's sinning. Yes, I mean, the woman ended up sinning because she's bypassing the man's authority and taking charge herself, and this is kind of what happened, but it's not like the man spoke up. She looked at the fruit. She's going, okay, it looks, it looks fine. It's pretty. It looks okay, and it's to gain wisdom, okay? Most people would say, well, you know, really, Adam's to blame. But the fact of the matter is she was not believing God. She bought into the devil casting doubt about God and questioning God. 
so that's probably why I don't like snakes. Now if I were Eve and I were hearing this because from Eve's perspective she's expecting to hear okay like you're dropping dead because I said if you eat it you're gonna die and so she knows that she deserves death. Then how encouraging to hear that God didn't just say cursed are you and you just drop dead because that is what she deserved but you see God extending grace to her and you see the fact that you know God's even saying offspring and she's going what I get to continue to live and then I get to also have the the joy of offspring how encouraging this must have been for her Eve here we see that in the end part of verse 15 when he says he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel here already God is promising Christ and this is ultimately he's foreshadowing the cross because this is what happened on the cross Satan's head was crushed he was defeated, although Satan did bruise Jesus' heel. That's pretty much explaining the struggles that women have in our daily lives, yes? So that's part of the fall. The complications in marriage and the desire to be the boss. But again, this is an encouraging word to Eve because she gets to live and she gets to have offspring. So that's awesome. Wow, that's grace right there and mercy right there from God. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, pretty much because you were silent and you didn't believe me over your wife and I gave you direct instruction, sir, and you have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you. you right, I didn't ask you. I didn't. It wasn't a suggestion. I commanded you. You shall not eat of it. Like, what did you not get about that? Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. And so there we have, because of the fall, the work that men do and we do it's not always pleasurable. It's going to be hard. It's part of the curse. Um, we came from dust. We're going to work hard, suffer in this life. That's part of the promise of the fall. We're going to return to the dust. And this is very important because this too is foreshadowing Christ. When Christ died on the cross, he was a sacrificial lamb. There had to be a payment for the consequences of our sin. And so here you see God killing an animal it's not from fig leaves which if you really think about it it's not very practical i mean it, it dries up and then what happens like you're exposed again but i guess that's your quick scrambling to cover right i mean we do that we do that in our lives here you see that god is sacrificing a lamb or sacrificing an animal an animal had to die and then there had to be bloodshed and then put on the righteousness put on a covering just like Jesus did for us. We literally put on Christ's righteousness at the exchange of receiving his grace, receiving the penalty, receiving the price that he paid for our sin. We, we're freely receiving because we can't earn it. We can't earn it. There's nothing about it that is a fair exchange between Jesus and you. God is literally saying, I will cover you. I will pay the price for you. And here he's already saying that right at the point of sin. So it's not like when you read the Bible and then God's like rethinking, okay, what do I do now? Okay, well, they sinned again. Oh, what should I do? And let's go to plan B. And then all the way, by the time we get to Revelation, oh, we're at plan Z, 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 or whatever. It's not like that. It was already in motion since the beginning of time. God knew. Again, God is putting protection there because what if, what if Adam was allowed to stay in the garden, right? Let's say he was. Then he, of course, in sin, is going to go sneak and eat the tree of life. So then there's never going to be an end to sin. It's going to be forever where he's just living in sin. God is saying, okay, he doesn't get to live forever with the consequences of his sin. That there's going to be an end to it, so just kick him out of the garden. He can come back, right? I mean, we can go back. Ultimately, the garden is a dwelling place with the Lord, wherever the Lord is. Here, you know, you see in the garden, they get to fellowship with God, and they get to interact with God and they get to walk with him in the cool of the day and they get to fellowship with him and have communion with him that is heaven God is saying no longer can you live here but because there will be an end to your life someday you will be able to return that is God's mercy and grace and his invitation it's there for us he's outside of time so he's saying at some point you'll be able to come back again if you let me kill an animal and I get to cover you that's awesome news, isn't it? I mean, the gospel is right there, even in the, the chapter in the Bible where it's talking about titled The Fall. The gospel's there too. So now we're, we're going to go into our Easter egg. So here we go. Day three, the fall. You can hear my children racing or knowing my daughter. She's already made a chart 
where everybody gets a day, and so there's a very orderly manner by which everybody can get it. Crack the egg. What is this, this day? Ta-da! So here we are, an apple. But in real life, probably in those days, it wasn't a Washington apple-looking apple. It was probably either a persimmon or a pomegranate or more like a Middle Eastern fruit. I want you to either write a poem or ponder this or journal about this and just let it resonate and sink in and just be in awe of God and how he's always, always asking you to come to him and repent. He's not surprised by your sin. He knows. That's why he already prepared a means of salvation for you. He provided Christ a means of you to come to him. Salvation depends entirely upon the Lord and not the rebel. That is excellent. That's that's why it's good news. For me, this is like a two-page thing today. My art form and my way of connecting with the Lord is often through painting or creating some kind of crafty art thing. Here I am. Originally when I was doing I was thinking about a picture book, so it would open this way. Here we have Adam hiding. Do you see my fig leaf here? You get it? So he's hiding in the garden. Where are you? Here's the other side. You can see the snake slinking in, in the dark. And then I, I put here on the fig leaf, but God. Dun, 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 dun. It's not the end of the story, right? Because God had a plan. Whenever we look at Adam and Eve's failure to believe God and to follow his commandments and their success in trying to go their own way, this failure points to their need for justification. It also points out that really you cannot have any kind of justification apart from God. Your sanctification in general happens through Christ, through that exchange of paying some other atonement for your sin. And so God is constantly pointing to his covenant of grace because it's undeserved. It's a gift. I'd also like to point out that, you know, when the woman was being tempted directly and how Satan still does that, where he just bypasses the man and he goes straight to the woman. And you look at our society and in the same way, when there's an absence of a man, absence of sort of the protection and the provision that the man is, is supposed to be in place to protect the woman and the children, Satan does immediately go for the woman. If you think about it, Satan can't procreate, but women can. And so what's the greatest way to get at God and to go against him and to make him angry and to hurt him? It's to go for his children and to take something that is a gift, such as being able to procreate and you know thwart it and mess it up and bring a spirit of confusion, a spirit that wants to do it apart from God, which grieves him. That's the way to attack God, because if it were head to head between Satan and God, it's a sure win for God. Satan knows that he has a limited time on earth and the way to attack God is to go through his children. This is exactly why Satan is doing this. I also want to point out that sin is essentially man's failure to trust God. It's an act or a state of unbelief. And it's an assertion of autonomy, wanting to be separate from God and be God himself. That's what we do. That's, how, that's essentially the core of what we're believing when we rebel against God. True religion consists of communion with God based on trust. Because of that trust, it, it issues obedience. We follow through with obedience. Because obedience is an expression of our trust. And it's an expression of our love. I want to encourage you to take heart. And I hope this makes you love God more because he loves you very much. There's no sin that you have committed that he cannot cover. He just wants you to come, confess your sin. And that's the thing. I think a lot of times people think that God is like standing there like this, like a law God wanting you to just follow the rules. But he gave us the law because he wanted us to see that we fall short of the law and that we can't keep the law and the law can't save us. I want you to begin to see Jesus like this, God like this. Come to me, come to me. I know, I know, I'm not surprised. I know, you tell me about it, come on. Let me clothe you, let me clean you, let me minister to you. Like a child who runs to their mommy for their boo-boo and a kiss on it, just I pray that you will go to God and he will be a safe place for you. All right, have a great day. It was great to connect with you over Easter Tree Day 3. See you tomorrow.